since the beginning of time, humans have noted the relationship between flowers and pollinators, such as bees and butterflies. And just as we are attracted to the bright yellow color of this primrose over here, it was thought that bees did the same. It wasn't until after you know, eons of human development that we gathered the tools to understand insect vision, to understand the, uh, the electromagnetic spectrum, and to have tools to actually look at different wavelengths of light. And it was only then did we realize that, in fact, bees see UV light, and under UV light, in the center of a flower, you have these very bright, prominent uh, landing strips that a bee can be directed to to pick up the nectar and therefore pollinate. So in general, we are really looking at the world through a methodological lens. And this um, methodological lens here is really important because the way that we look at a problem can deeply influence the way that we think about the system that we are studying. And it's really important to make sure that aspects of these methods don't necessarily get confused with the properties of the system. So we sort of have to see the whole mammoth, uh, so to speak. And so this is a double-edged sword that in having new technologies can allow us to uh, see new things. We also just have to be mindful of the effects of technologies on the way that we perceive the world. And sleep has a couple of examples like this. So if you were studying sleep in the 1950s and 60s, you might be using a grass machine like this, and it would cut the paper tape after every 30 seconds. Well, that's how people would look at sleep. That got adapted into the RNK scoring just because that's what people were used to doing. And now, 60 years later, we're still doing the same thing. Now, there's no problem in doing that so long as you want, so long as the, the fact that it's an engineering choice rather than an intrinsic property of sleep, that that understanding does not get lost. So it's very important to ask ourselves, well, what would have happened if so, how would we view sleep differently if the grass machine went out to two minutes or 10 seconds, right? So it's just important to keep a methodological lens in mind as we're moving forward. And ultimately, we have to ask the question, what if we re-examine sleep data with fresh eyes using the latest technologies? If pretending sleep medicine history didn't exist, we came up this data, uh, these data fresh with the latest uh, approaches, would we look at things, would we find the same things, would we find different things? And ultimately, we'd like to move towards approaches that integrates our understanding of signal processing with our burgeoning understanding of the neural mechanisms of the brain. So we have a bunch of ways of exploring this, but one of the, I'm going to talk about one example today, and this is sort of re-examining the concept of the spindle. So in order to sort of re-examine the spindle, we have to think about, well, what, what does it take to discover the spindle? Well, if you wanted to discover the spindle, you'd have to go back to 1935. Fred Astaire's Dancing Cheek to Cheek is number one on the charts, and you'd need a tycoon who was a self-styled gentleman scientist who got even more wealthy by divesting from the stock market just before the crash, investing in gold and reinvesting in the stock market at pennies on the dollar after the crash. And that person happens to be Alfred Lee Loomis. And he's a really fascinating character that I, I just had no uh, awareness of until really getting into this field and doing this research. And so what he ended up doing was uh, because he was this, he wanted to be this gentleman scientist, like these British people that he, uh, he, he thought uh, a lot about. He purchased this uh, mansion in Tuxedo Park in New York, and he stocked it, through, uh, stocked it up with the latest and greatest scientific toys and invited with engraved invitation all the best uh, scientists of the world. And in this Loomis laboratory, all sorts of exciting things came out of this. Um, most importantly, the work that uh, Loomis funded and spearheaded was responsible for the development and improvement of the radar, and many people credit this work with turning the tide for the Allies in World War II. They also did fun things like death rays, uh, for small animals. They looked at timing, uh, uh, mechanisms of improved timing, and also some of these things led to uh, the development of the ultrasound. But he was also, he was really sort of like the closest person I could uh, 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 compare him to. He was sort of like an Elon Musk of the day. Um, and he sort of looked at what sort of fancied him. And among these things, he was really interested in brain waves. So here he is in front of this drum recorder is eight feet long, 44 inches in circumference, and it revolved once a minute. And this is what they would use to do polysomnography because he was just very interested in it. Now, 
Alfred uh, Loomis, you know, tycoon, uh, scientific visionary, uh, visionary, not really known for being the best father and husband. He experimented on his son, Henry Loomis, who was in his early teens at the time. And, I, and, and, and uh, he would do great things like sneak in while he was speak, uh, sleeping and tell him that his boat was on fire, watch uh, Henry wake up and try to put out the flames and uh, have a good laugh, but also understand that we can actually perceive things while we are in, in deep sleep. And out of this polysomnography came these recordings, and these are actual recordings uh, that were drawn from the uh, drum recorder. And you can see, we see these EEG uh, squiggles uh, that were made by this, uh, this pen. And so how, what was the state of the art analysis of these uh, sorts of signals? Well, uh, one of the best instruments of all, the human eye. And here are some other people that I'm sure many people in this uh, audience will recognize, at least by name, uh, examining these paper tapes of EEGs. Uh, and I, I think it's really important to pause here for a second and think of how much of the way that we think about sleep is influenced by what people in the 1930s saw by eye in these sleep recordings and, 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 and uh, understand the implications of that. So following these experiments, Loomis, Harvey, and Hobart uh, published a paper in Science in 1935 in which they published a bunch of their observations about what they saw in the EEG, but in particular, they noticed bursts lasting between one and one and a half seconds at about 14 hertz. And they said, we have designated these as spindles because of their appearance in the record. And as far as I know, this is the uh, original coining of the term spindles that came from here. So 85 years later, what is a spindle? Well, a spindle is really a specific time domain waveform pattern that's identified by an expert. The gold standard is expert detection. So if an expert calls it a spindle, it is a spindle. It's sort of the uh, Justice Potter Stewart, I know it when I see it definition. Now we have codified this a little bit more in terms of sleep scoring manuals, right? But um, uh, essentially what we, uh, what we do is we have this sort of broad definition of this wiggly waveform. So um, let me see if I can get rid of this little thing here. Okay. Um, typically, these uh, appear every uh, they they appear at a rate of two point five to three spindles per minute. Now, spindles have been especially interesting uh, because of their linkage with certain thalamocortical networks, but also their association with really important processes like memory consolidation, as well as changes during aging and disease. Um, and so, these have really it's really been a recent hot topic. So I just wanna make very clear in moving forward in this talk, when I talk about spindles, I'm talking about a waveform. We, as of now, do not from the EEG alone have the capability to know from whence a waveform is derived. So we are just going to be talking about phenomenology of the waveforms, some of which are generated from specific mechanisms, but we can't tell, okay? So as I said, the state of the art in analysis is looking at these paper tapes by eye. Well, why is that potentially problematic? Well, these sort of transient oscillations are in fact exceptionally difficult to see by eye based off of what the noise characteristics are and where in the waveform they fall. And so as you can see, these simulated spindles here are going above some uh, physiologically uh, accurate noise and over some slow oscillatory, act, slow oscillatory activity. And you can see there are points, in fact, in which these are completely obscured from, uh, from, uh, from view. And so it's a question now of saying, well, hold on a second. When we're talking about spindle phenomenology, are we talking about a true underlying of uh, uh, waveform, or are we talking about just the things that there are the easiest for people to see by eye and waveform traces? And we can see that this is actually borne out when people try to identify these. Here are two experts looking at the same six segments. And you can see that when they count the number of spindles, there are vast differences in the amount that these uh, experts report. And moving forward, there are lots of studies that show differences between scores, difference between uh, automated algorithms, and differences between all the scores and the algorithms. And ultimately, this is because any sort of automated method or machine learning approach is the goal it tends to be to replicate flawed human scoring. So we end up sort of in a circularity and chicken and the egg. So what's our new methodological lens that we're going to do to look at this uh, 
phenomenology? Well, it's the multi-taper spectrogram, and it's just a, a way of looking at things in the time frequency domain. So x-axis is time, y-axis frequency, and color is power. And this actually allows us to see an entire night of sleep in one eyeful, but actually go and zoom into these micro events. And for those of you who are interested at our website, sleepeg.org, and we have an aptly named paper related to this, we have full tutorials that can teach you how to understand this, and as well as how to score sleep using these methods. So what can we do? Well, by taking something like this in the time domain and making it into the time frequency domain, here's what happens. We get these spindles appearing as these blobs, which we'll call time frequency peaks in the spectrogram above. And this is what you can see is that no matter where they go, and even in the presence of some pretty strong noise, these, uh, these, these time frequency peaks are very robustly visible. And so this says, well, maybe we should use this as the basis of inquiry. And so if we take a look into, here's a segment of non-REM sleep uh, over about an hour of the, uh, in the multi-taper spectrogram. If we zoom in on this sigma band here, we can see, oh, wait a second, this evolves into a lot of these little blobs here. If we zoom in even further, we say, okay, well, look at this. Every time we see a blob, we see a little spindle-like waveform. This could be interesting. And in fact, there's a principled mathematical reason behind this. Any sort of transient oscillation, which means a short burst of oscillatory uh, power in the time domain, will be by definition, uh, will appear by definition as a time frequency peak in the spectrogram. And moving forward, we're just gonna call these TF peaks. These are gonna come up a lot more. So now here's a, a waveform trace and you can take a minute to see, are there spindles here? How many spindles do you see? Where are the spindles? Well, an expert scored these regions as having spindles. But when we look at this in the time frequency, we see that yes, indeed, these blobs, uh, there are blobs, these time frequency peaks corresponding with these spindles. But we also see a whole bunch of other similar looking time frequency peaks that are not scored at spindles. So this is sort of interesting. And in fact, when we look at this across different subjects from different uh, uh, data sets and also under different referencing schemes, we see a couple of things. We see that there are a lot more spindles than we expect. Uh, if you expect there to be only two to three per minute, uh, many times that in fact, we see that uh, for the most part, every time someone scores a, a spindle in the time domain, there is a time frequency peak. And uh, it seems that only the strongest of these time frequency peaks are scored. So this is what we see in our just sort of empirical observations by eye. Um, we're doing the same thing that they did in 1935, just looking at a different piece of paper. Um, and so we have to ask ourselves, do traditional spindles represent only a small subset of a broader phenomenology? So how do we approach this? And again, we're just starting from basics, starting with the most obvious, simple things to do. Well, the first thing we do is let's score blobs. And so I developed this program where you can go in and you can basically take a spectrogram, start scoring spindles wherever you think there's a spindle. And this allows you to sort of create at least a first blush attempt of looking at these things. And so what did we do? Well, we, um, we looked at them in a couple of data sets, and the two that I'm going to talk about today is the DREAMS database. It was eight subjects with 30-minute segment, both healthy and those with sleep pathologies, and it had experts scored spindles in the time domain. And for those, we scored time frequency peaks on six subjects on C3. Then, um, thanks to the uh, generosity of Dara Minowak, we're also looking at full night data from control subjects uh, that came out of the Wamsley 2002 uh, paper. And uh, we scored five subjects from those in C3. Now, this ended up being, and I'd like to take a moment to recognize Tanya Dimitrov, our research assistant, who hand scored, you know, 17.5 thousand of these TF peaks, is really a Herculean task. And from all of these TF peaks across all of these, we automatically extracted features such as the central frequency, the frequency at the, the maximum point, uh, the prominence, which is sort of the height relative to baseline, and the duration, which is how long it lasts, and the bandwidth. So we were able to get all of these features. And what we could do is we could just start say, okay, so how do the hand scored P TF peaks uh, compare to the hand scored spindles on these dream databases? And essentially what we were able to do is do this and create sort of a confusion matrix like you would um, in any detection problem. And the first thing that we saw in all of these things, there were about two to three times the rate of time frequency peaks scored by hand than there were spindles scored by hand. But what was interesting is that essentially 
of the spindles that were scored by hand were also time frequency peak. So oh, that's very interesting. So now we actually take a look at all of the things that were scored here and their actual morphological properties. And so in this case, the um, the blue uh, distributions are those scored in the time frequency domain. So those are the TF peaks by hand. And the, uh, the sort of salmon color is the uh, traditionally scored spindles. And so what we can see, what's really interesting is that in anything other than the prominence, which is sort of the intensity of the, of, of the blob, right? Um, everything sort of nests within each other, that there really appears to be very identical distributions except for the number scored in frequency, bandwidth, and duration. And we just seem to get more in lower frequency, uh, lower, uh, lower amplitude. So this sort of jives with our observation. But let's move forward. Well, why deal with the inconsistency of human hand scoring? Let's look at auto-detected spindles. So we looked at these time frequency peak versus auto-detected spindles. And we use, in fact, the method from uh, the Wamsley paper, which was found uh, in, in a different paper and through other means to be the most accurate in reflecting human scored spindles. We're using that now as a surrogate of human scored spindles. Well, we see it's about two, three times the rate overall, but what we now see is that our precision has improved. 95% of the things that were detected as spindles were also TF peaks. And getting this greater number, we see the same thing. We see that the uh, distributions for duration, bandwidth, and central frequency look exceptionally similar and are completely nested with those of the TF peaks, but we just see a lot more at lower frequencies. So now what's the problem with using these auto detectors? Maybe they're saying something that, uh, you know, they're a little, they're certainly more objective, but automated uh, detectors use a fixed threshold on either an amplitude or um, some sort of uh, measure of spectral power. And these are optimized to match human scoring. So again, it is tuning an algorithm to replicate what things are most easily seen by eye. And so these thresholds are essentially placing a rarity assumption on the number of spindles based on something like a standard deviation from the mean. And spindle detectors really could now, because of what we see, because they're based on I, they maybe they have this false rarity assumption. So we have to ask, well, maybe we can just lower the threshold. What happens? So here's what we have here. And if you guys can see my pointer. So here is sort of a bandpass filter within the sigma range, which is sort of what one of these detectors would see. And here's, in fact, what the, um, the signal that this Walmsley detector is actually looking at and has a threshold that, excuse me, 4.5 times the, um, the mean of this signal. And so every time it's above this threshold, it marks that area. And if it's above a certain duration, it marks it as a, uh, as a spindle. So now what we're going to do, and what you can see is that over here are the times that were scored by hand as a time frequency peak, and we're very much subselecting those. So now if we decrease the threshold, we say, okay, we have a lot more, and everything that's added now actually does correspond with a time frequency peak. And we lower it even more, and then for the, and, and we essentially get to a point where it looks like if we lower these thresholds, we just converge to time frequency peaks. So what do we do with this? Well, what we can do is we can now optimize the threshold to say, what is the best fit that we can get using this F1 statistic? What is the best fit that we can get that matches up with the time frequency peaks? So what we do is we can optimize that. And overall, we reduce the precision a little bit. Uh, it goes from 95 to 85%, but the recall goes way up. So it's how many things, you know, making sure that we're not, uh, that, that everything that is scored as a time frequency peak is also scored as a, uh, as a spindle the other way around. So that goes way up. And what's interesting is the max F1 score. Again, this is a general metric of fit in time where you don't have true negatives. Um, but it's, it becomes much higher. It goes to 85.85. Uh, now, what's exciting about this is that they did the same experiment saying, how can we maximize the same detector for hand scored symbol? What's the best that we can do? And it turns out that the most that they could do was about uh, F1 of about in the, like around 0.6 range. And so what this says is that if we optimize the same detector, which was designed for spindles for time frequency peak, it actually optimizes better than when optimizing for spindles. So we do better at finding TF peaks with this method than hand scored spindles. Now, what's interesting about this is saying, well, can we just find a new spindle and be done with this all? Well, between subjects, it turns out there's a very high variability between the thresholds. 
And it, so it essentially means that there's no really clear single lower threshold. And we've done a bunch of experiments on that that I won't talk about today. But it, at a certain point, when you lower the threshold, you start picking up garbage and that messes everything up. So we need to do a little bit better than that. And how can we move forward? Well, what we've done, and again, I won't get into the real details of this, but we essentially use the properties of our TF peaks and basically use them to automatically identify uh, these TF peaks. And so here are the hand scored methods. Uh, th these are the ones that were hand scored by our uh, research tech. And when we apply our method to this, this is what we get. And so with, and this is again, using an unsupervised method that does not require us to uh, set a fixed threshold and it's set automatically per person. And so now we can take these broad swaths of time, and in fact, entire nights, and automatically grab all of these peaks. So this is really great. And what we can do is convince ourselves that this is doing a good job, because when we look at the peaks that were uh, TF peaks scored by hand, and the PF peaks stored by our auto method, which are the ones in uh, Salmon, we see that we almost identically match up these distributions. So now that we have both an auto spindle detector and an auto uh, TF peak detector, we can run it on all 17 subjects. Uh, and we can see that we again still have about three times the number of events as the auto spindles, but our precision is 97%. So almost every single spindle that was, de that was detected by an auto detected spindle now that we've removed human variability in both the TF peak and the spindle detection was picked up as a TF peak. So, um, and again, we can look at the distribution of these things and in everything other than log prominence, we have a really complete nesting of the uh, spindle properties within the time frequency peak properties. And what's actually exciting about this is if we now go back to the first thing that we saw, hand versus hand versus, uh, and then auto versus auto, these were on different data sets. These were on, in, in fact, even different referencing scheme. The auto versus auto uses thousands more spindles than were taken in the hand versus hand. But you can see that this almost identically me uh, measures and confirms the distributional comparison between these. So I think we we've done a really good job of sort of ticking all the boxes off here. Moreover, we can look at the morphology of these and see that in this panel over here, these, this is what in the time frequency domain Everything, if we, if we look at the, the, the times that were picked by both detectors, we see this nice, super clear time frequency domain. Then if we look at the times that were picked only by the time uh, the, the auto TF peak detector, we see again, a really clear time frequency peak, just a lesser amplitude here. And then if we look at the spindle auto only, it's, we have some sort of things probably where, where the detector messed up a little bit, some garbage below, but this really only constituted 1% of the time that the spindle detector picked up something the TF peak detector did not. So what's exciting about this? Well, we can now look at things and see what we gain with this. Well, one of the things we can look at night, to, um, we can look at correlation and these correlate very well. So what if we were just picking up random peaks and just greater numbers? Well, uh, that wouldn't be useful. So we confirm this by saying for two nights of these 17 subjects, in both cases, we get identical correlations, very close in the slope, so about three times. And in both cases, the intercepts don't differ from zero. So this reliably varies with uh, uh, traditional spindle detection. But what's exciting about this too, is that if we look at night to night consistency here, here is spindle detector, night one versus night two, and we have a uh, correlation coefficient about 0.6, all right? With the same data, if we look at the time frequency we peak night to night variability, it jumps way up to 0.98. So what we have here is something that is exceptionally consistent it fits all of the distributional properties in terms of the morphology for the time frequency peak and has a lot more statistical power and is a lot more, uh, uh, reduces variability night to night. So overview of this, we say that spindles here are based off of what is easily visible by eye. And these automated methods that mimic uh, human scores, they impose a false rarity assumption on the events. Um, nearly all the scored spindles correspond with a TF peak, but not vice versa. And the spindle properties are essentially uh, indistinguishable from TF peak properties, except for the magnitude. So we can, I think, say with fairly good confidence that these spin that traditionally scored spindles are therefore a, a clear subset of the TF peaks that we observe in the sigma range.
And so we therefore find no justification for excluding them from spindle phenomenology analyses. And what are the implications of this? Well, you know, we say there are more TF peaks in spindle by about three times. They have better night to night consistency. The threshold adjusted spindle detectors actually do a better job of detecting TF peaks than spindles. And therefore, we can make the statement that TF peaks and sigma are a more complete representation of the under uh, underlying phenomenology. Thus, we believe that future work must therefore re examine spindle activity under this new and improved framework. Okay, I'm going to take a little drink here. So now this is what we have. And now we can ask the question, well, what's next? I can, um, and so we'll give you a little taste. This is an hour and a half talk in and of itself, but I'll give you a little taste of what's, uh, what's going on here. So what if we look beyond sigma? Say, why do, we, why do we stop with just looking at TF peaks in the range where spindles are known? What if we detect time frequency peaks at all frequencies, okay? If we detect time frequency peaks at all frequencies, and then instead of saying, well, these are the ones that matter and these don't, what we can do is something a little bit more agnostic. Instead of detecting specific peaks, what we can say is, let's just pick all the peaks that we find, big, small, long, short, whatever. And then instead of saying, these are the peaks that matter, we're just gonna look at the distribution of peaks at each frequency. And I'll show you how that works. So we have an improved and sort of uh, more advanced method of doing this, but we can take the, spec the spectrogram, this is a spectrogram of the entire night of sleep, and look for time frequency peaks at all frequencies using this automated, this an improved method here. And what we get is these little dots all over the place and the size of the dot represents the uh, magnitude of the time frequency peak. And so now what we end up having is about 60,000 peaks per night. And so instead of trying to say which ones matter and which ones don't, what we can do is look across time and for each frequency go across and say what's the average rate of spindles, or sorry, of TF peaks at each of these frequencies. And we can come up with this rate histogram. And this rate histogram here shows here's a big mode. So again, a mode is a bump in the distribution right where we see all this traditional spindle activity. And so we can do this again on this uh, same subject, uh, same, same, same data set, and here's what we see. Well, the first thing that we observe here are four different subjects here. And we observe that these are healthy controls, but there's vast heterogeneity in the shapes that we see. We see one subject has one kind of bump here. And as many of you know, there are sort of, there are fast and slow spindles that were found. This appears like this subject only has what might traditionally be called a fast spindle. Here's another subject that has two bumps, this is fast and, and slow here. But here's another subject that has a mode here at the traditional spindle frequency, but a mode here in the low alpha. And here's another subject that has three different modes here. So one here, one, at, uh, one uh, at sort of a lower frequency and one at the low alpha. So this tells us, first of all, that even within a subject, uh, a cohort of very uh, well-controlled subjects, you have vast heterogeneity. And if you can imagine, thinking I'm only going to look at a small subset of events from just this small frequency range, you might be missing out on a lot. And actually when we integrate through this frequency range over here, uh, we get very equivalent things to what we found with our auto TF peak detector in terms of rates. Now the next thing to note is that if you can see behind each of these blue traces is a gray trace. And they're so hard to see is a really exciting thing because that represents of two nights of sleep, the second, uh, this, the, this is the, the, the other night of sleep that they had on two consecutive nights is represented by the gray trace. And as you can see, they are almost exactly the same. So not only are these, the, the regression that we showed from better night to night consistency across these detective spindle-like TF peaks, right? What we now see is that TF peaks across the entire frequency range uh, are almost exactly the same night to night. And this actually mimics uh, some of the spectral analysis that was done in a paper by Roy Cox recently. And so this is a really good validation of this. And so what's interesting here is we should go beyond just averaging over things, right? These are dynamic processes that evolve over time. I'm just checking my time here. Um, and so what we can see here is that um, we have a uh, two subjects, one with one bump and one with two bumps over here. But if we look at this subject, we see that these lower bumps, which one could say correspond with uh, slow spindles, 
tend to only occur at points where there is non-REM3 sleep that you can see in, this, in the hypnogram over here. And if we, uh, we look and we see how those evolve over the course of the night, and if we find the one little area where this is scored stage three in this first subject, we can see a little shadow of these lower uh, frequency, time frequency peaks. So what does that mean? Maybe this is just a function of dynamics. And so what we want to do now is track how these change in terms of an objective continuous value metric of depth of sleep. Instead of using discrete sleep stages, we want to look at this as a continuum because in every way, shape, and form sleep has been studied, it's been shown to be a continuum. So what we do is we go back to the old literature on the two process, pro, uh, two, uh, two process model of sleep, and we look at the slow oscillation power as an uh, objective surrogate for depth of sleep, in particular for non-REM sleep. And if you look at this right here, you can see that this slow, uh, slow wave power here oops, um, is a direct mirror of this technician scored hypnogram and we don't have to deal with staging at all. So what do we do with this? Well, what we can say is, well, let's compare, uh, let's, let's say that the depth of sleep, let's look at these time frequency uh, peaks as a function of depth of sleep. So what we can do is we can highlight the times, and this is a, a simulation, a schematic here, where the uh, slow wave power is all within the same range. And then within those times, look at what's happening with the time frequency peaks there, and then compute the average rate at each frequency for the time frequency peaks. And then we look at just the next little area, a little higher at other bin of the slow wave power. And then we look at the time frequency peaks there and look at the average, and we keep doing that until we have what we call a, 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 a slow oscillation power histogram. So again, the x-axis here is you can think of as increasing slow wave power, and also increasing depth of sleep. Frequency is still frequency, and this color here is not spectral power, but it's the average rate of the time frequency peaks in that frequency at that depth of sleep. So we can do this for real data, and again, you can see over here, here's the inverted hypnogram in gray over the slow oscillation power. And so what we're able to do is that converges into something like this. So this shows us here, again, depth of sleep, slow wave power in this direction, excuse me, uh, frequency in this direction, and then rate as, as the color here. And what we can see is various modes uh, across the depth of sleep. We see that there is a mode here in the slow, uh, in the sort of fast spindle range. And then as depth of sleep increases, it switches almost completely to uh, a, a lower frequency that might correspond with slow spindles. We also see, surprisingly, a big strong mode here at about five, you know, uh, three to five hertz. And then at the very lowest rate, we see a continuously increasing uh, rate, which basically lets us know that our definition of slow wave power is consistent. And you can see below that, tied with this uh, slow wave power, is how you look at the percentage of time and that how it breaks down in terms of the traditional sleep stages and how they really, it makes a, tr uh, a nice transition from being mostly wake to mostly REM, mostly N1, N2, N3. So this validates our existing assumptions. So, what we're doing, so why is this useful? So we can look at all the detected peaks as a function of a continuous metric of sleep. And this collapses away the sleep architecture so we can compare between subjects and groups without really needing any sleep scoring and look at this really broader sense and a much broader uh, idea of this phenomenology. Well, we can also do the same thing on a different time scale. It's well known that spindles tend to uh, uh, for the most part, occur with specific phases of the slow oscillation. So for every uh, time frequency peak that we have here, we were able to plot the color based off of the phase of the slow oscillation at that time that peak occurred. And without telling you anything, you can see that, oops, um, when I move my mouse here, it adjusts, as, uh, it moves the slide. But you can see here that this, uh, this band here of the high frequency is mostly around zero, where we know that uh, fast spindles tend to be. And we can see that this uh, band over here in this lower frequency is more blue, so it's near you know, plus or minus pi. So doing the same thing that we did with the slow oscillation power, we can do with the slow oscillation phase. And now what we can see is we can make a graphic like this, where here is across the entire night, every time frequency peak as a function is plotted as a function of phase and frequency. And we get these cleared bumps and modes here. And you can see that there's a mode at zero, right at about 15 hertz that corresponds with this band over here, and a mode around 10 or 15, uh, you know, eight to 10 hertz that corresponds with this uh, 
you know, negative pi pi uh, to this band that we see over here. So what we can now do is look at these across subjects and what we can see is that we actually have something very exciting here that just as we've seen with every other metric so far, there is exceptional night to night uh, consistency, but very strong intersubject variability. So these are three different subjects. Here is from night one, this is the power histogram, and here's the phase histogram. Same for night two. So we have three different subjects, and this I think has great promise, not only as sort of an EEG fingerprint, but as a way of, ex of very, very concisely um, describing the activity of thousands and thousands of different oscillatory events over the course of sleep at a large time scale and small time scale all in this very concise uh, graphic over here. And thus I think it has great potential to serve as a um, uh, potential biomarkers and we're looking at these and how these change under uh, aspects of disease and aging and other things like that. So sort of to wrap this all up, where have we come from? So we started with squiggles uh, observed by eye to blobs observed by eye to the concept of a time frequency peak to these really complex and concise characterization of uh, a broad class of events. Um, and so what we're doing in each case is really broadening our lens of what exactly uh, these sorts of phenomenology represent. So really moving forward, we have to sort of ask ourselves, you know, what are we going to do with all of this? And I think there were many ways in sleep that uh, looking forward and, and, and really looking at sleep with fresh eyes um, allows us to really expand what we're doing. We're at such an exciting time in sleep uh, science with the convergence of you know, large medical uh, and, and data repositories such as the NSRR being available online are burgeoning uh, really uh, great understanding of these underlying neural mechanisms, both from humans and rodents, uh, increased image mo uh, modalities for and uh, high resolution techniques, increased computational uh, analyses with things like source localization and increased computational power. And so we want to, you know, sort of ask ourselves, while it is really good to take this time to validate things in terms of what the original framework was, there is also value in simultaneously looking at things anew. And uh, I think that in doing so, we'll be able to make such uh, outstanding and exciting progress in the years to come. At the same time, keeping in mind that future generations may look back on us looking at these silly blobs on two-dimensional screens and these ugly rainbow uh, color maps and saying, what the heck were we thinking? So thank you so very much. Um, I uh, would like to have a, a couple of acknowledgements here. First of all, uh, the Prayer Out Lab, all the people who uh, work so hard to do this, in particular, Tanya Dimitrov worked scoring all of these uh, time frequency peaks. Alex Hu has done a spectacular job really uh, taking the reins of that first project and uh, looking at all these sort of exciting next steps to take. Patrick Stokes and Pratish Roth uh, were uh, instrumental in the second half of the talk in sort of uh, developing the methodologies and uh, results for that. And, uh, and also in particular, the uh, collaborators, Dara Minowick for uh, her insight and uh, use of the data and also uh, Robert Stickle for, for the same and excellent guidance.